please let me um, uh, give you a very brief background of Kaywin's many accomplishments. As a graduate of the University of Michigan, she did masters in both art history and archaeology at the University of London. She has uh, led the Memphis Museum of Art in Tennessee, as well as the Minneapolis Institute of Art on the board of the Terra Foundation, National Trust for Historic Preservation, has been president of the American Association of Museum Directors, and is now the first female director of the National Gallery of Art. We have a mutual friend who said, Kaylin believes strongly in opening museums to audiences of all kinds, and at all the places she has worked, she tries to engage all people with energy and imagination. Please help me welcome Kaylin. Thank you so much. Um, I realize that um, I'm the only thing standing between you and a drink, so I will try to keep this uh, short and lively, but I'm thrilled to be here. Thank you so much for uh, listening this evening, Denise, for the invitation. And um, next year marks my 30th year as a museum director, and um, needless to say, I am thrilled and honored to be at the National Gallery of Art and um, due in very large part to one individual who's here tonight, which is Andrew Saul. Andrew served on the board uh, that hired me. Uh, uh, our small board was also the search committee. So Andrew, I think we all want to um, thank you for your brilliance, your excellent judgment of people. Um, thank you. <laughs> okay, so, uh, and after Andrew called me, um, while I was considering the opportunity at the gallery, I asked a mentor of mine for advice. I told him that I'd always worked at museums that were deeply embedded in a single community, and that I didn't know how to approach a federal institution. Richard leaned forward and said with excitement, yes, but the nation becomes your community. And what does that mean? And I immediately was excited. I love a challenge, and, um, and that's what I want to talk with you about today. And I want to really focus on how, um, during its development, the National Gallery has actually responded throughout its history to contemporary society, locally and nationally, and how we might do so in today's uh, volatile world. My story has three chapters, and we're going to start in the early part of the 20th century. The Mellon name stands at the origin of the National Gallery. Our founder, who you see on the screen, uh, Andrew W. Mellon, made his fortune through banking and investments in industrialization. He was raised in Pittsburgh, where he met men like Henry Clay Frick, who introduced him to European art. President Warren G. Harding tapped Mellon to serve as Secretary of the Treasury, and he worked under three U.S. presidents, Harding, Coolidge, and Hoover. During his service, he navigated payment of World War I debts, multiple taxation proposals, the construction of a multitude of federal buildings, and the Great Depression. Out of favor after 11 years in office and facing possible impeachment, in 1932, Hoover offered Mellon a graceful exit as the position of the ambassador to the court of St. James. Mellon began quietly communicating to his family his interest in founding a National Gallery of Art, modeled on the National Gallery in London. And in 1936, he actually wrote a letter to President Roosevelt, suggesting that America needed such a gallery and offering to donate his collection and the necessary funds to build it. The gift was accepted by the president and Congress, and work began on the John Russell Pope-designed building in 1937. Tragically, Mellon died that year after only seeing the building's foundation dug. And in a weird twist of fate, Pope, the architect, died the next day. The construction of the 500,000 square foot building cost Mellon $15 million, which is about $300 million in today's money. Within four weeks of its opening in 1941, we, opened, we uh, welcomed over one million visitors. During the museum's dedication, President Roosevelt said, to accept this work today for the people of this democratic nation is to assert the belief of the people of this democratic nation in a human spirit 
which now is everywhere endangered, and which in many countries where it first found form and meaning has been rooted out, broken, and destroyed. Now, at the time, Europe was embroiled in the Second World War, and just nine months later, the United States entered the conflict. During the month of the speech, March of 1941, Hitler authorized the expansion of Auschwitz, and Britain suffered heavy bombing by the Luftwaffe. It moves me profoundly that during some of humanity's darkest hours, the President and Congress recognized that art would be central to our free democracy and to the sustenance of the human spirit. This belief continues to motivate and guide our work today. In his gift, Mellon demonstrated the importance of a big vision. He created a building so large that we occupied less than 40% of it when we first opened. His hypothesis that American generosity would soon fill the galleries has proven true. We opened with 546 works, and 82 years later, we hold over 156,000 works in trust for the nation. Mellon embodied generosity. He gave his collection and the money to build the building, but he insisted that his name not be on it. Now, as you know, grand marble-clad neoclassical museum buildings are often criticized today for being intimidating and elitist. I think, however, that Mellon's gesture was truly populist. He believed that all people, regardless of their background, education, or social standing, deserve magnificence. And he ensured that we would always be free of charge. Our founding Mellon collection included 126 paintings and 26 sculptures. And today, roughly 70% of his collection remains on view, which is really a testament to his great eye. Madonna and Child on a Curved Throne, a 13th century Byzantine painting, is listed as the very first work in the gallery's collection and is also one of our oldest paintings. Following the Fourth Crusade in 1204, many icons were brought to Italy from Byzantine sanctuaries in Greece and Constantinople. And here on the screen, we see the abstracted style of these icons, the gold striations that define folds in clothing, the round volume of Mary's veiled head, and the frontal pose of Jesus, who looks more like a miniature adult than a child, are all part of the Byzantine tradition. Mellon never intended to collect any school of painting in a comprehensive fashion, but rather to stud the crown with singular jewels, Favorites of mine include Holbein the Younger's Edward VI, a portrait of Henry VIII's only legitimate male heir, who here at the age of just two already appears formidable and ready to command an army. I'm also fond of Vermeer's radiantly beautiful Girl with a Red Hat, one of three paintings by Vermeer in the collection and a perennial audience favorite. Working through a variety of middlemen, starting in 1929, Joseph Stalin began selling works of art out of the collection of the Hermitage to finance Russia's industrialization. Mellon acquired 21 paintings for a total price of $6.6 .6 million, or $133 million in today's money. And as a reminder, he was Secretary of the Treasury the same time that he was buying paintings from Joseph Stalin. And he tucked them into the basement of the Corcoran Gallery, um, and they weren't seen until um, he gifted them to us. To highlight just a few of the masterpieces he bought from Stalin, the sale included this famous tondo by Raphael known as the Alba Madonna, painted around 1510. Unlike the ethereal Byzantine Madonna perched high up on a gold throne, here we see the Madonna planted firmly on the ground delicate colors, idealized landscape, and harmonious proportions are classically Renaissance. Mellon also purchased this beautiful masterpiece by Titian, Venus with a Mirror, a standout in his oeuvre. This painting remained in, in his collection on his death, nearly 20 years after he painted it. And in the galleries, I always stop to admire one of Botticelli's rare multi-figure complex compositions, 
the adoration of the Magi. Stalin apparently said that he didn't mind send it, selling these works of art to the Americans because he knew that the United States would eventually fall and become part of the Soviet Union. The other significant gift at the time of our opening was artwork given by Samuel H. Kress. Kress, who made his money from five and dime stores, decided that since he earned his money from the nation, he would give it back to the nation. He and his foundation gave his collection of 3,500 old master works to American museums with the lion's share coming to the National Gallery. I always visit this stunning and rare painting of the Adoration of the Shepherds by Giorgione. It's an excellent example of the innovative deployment of high quality color in the Venetian Renaissance. And in fact, recent research from colleagues in conservation science revealed the use of glass in the red lake paint used by, in the Virgin's mantle. In the cross section on the screen, you can see that Giorgione applied red lake underpaint below the blue ultramarine layer. The shadows of the Virgin's mantle were formed with a top layer of translucent purple paint, creating a deeper color than would the simple darker blue. Not all crest paintings are Italian, and favorites of mine from the other European schools include El Greco's weird and ethereal Laocoon. The subject of Laocoon and his sons struggling against serpents sent by the gods to punish him became popular after the discovery in 1506 of an ancient sculpture in Rome. Everything about this dynamic painting communicated doom and agony for Laocoon and his sons. Although perhaps not as tragic, but filled with doom, is Hieronymus Bosch's Death and the Miser. As a kind of macabre room service, you can see death reaching around the door for the miser. And we see a creature under the bed curtains offering the miser a bag of money. An angel kneeling to the right is hopefully pointing out at the crucifix in the window. So as death calls, our poor miser is torn between the final path of good and evil. The time is, of course, running out for him. When we opened, we had fewer than a dozen American paintings. They were sparsely displayed in three rather empty galleries. Our early ambivalence toward American art reflected the gallery's founding view that European painting was really the pinnacle of artistic achievement. And Mellon always envisioned a very small national collection with singular masterpieces instead of a representative assemblage telling the full story of American art. On to chapter two. While Andrew, Mel Andrew Mellon's children, Paul and Elsa, shared his big vision, boundless generosity, and commitment to excellence, they also recognized the need for the museum to be of its time and to serve the needs of contemporary audiences. In fact, during Paul Mellon's speech at the dedication, he said, it was my father's hope, and it is ours, that the National Gallery would become not a static, but a living institution, growing in usefulness and importance to artists, scholars, and the general public. So what did it mean to be useful to Americans during the 1950s, 60s, and 70s? This period was the height of the Cold War, a time of ideological and political struggle between the Western and Eastern blocs. The United States and her allies created NATO and, prom and promoted a global policy of containment. It was a war fought with propaganda, espionage, sports rivalry, and the space race. Culture, of course, fit into the rivalry and patriotism of the time. One of the gallery's most historic moments was the loan of the Leonardo da Vinci Mona Lisa from the Louvre in 1963. The special one-picture loan was made directly to the President of the United States by the President of France. All arrangements were handled by the White House, and the Mona Lisa traveled in her own stateroom aboard the USS, the SS United States. The painting, as you can see here, was installed on a baffle draped in red velvet and was guarded around the clock by US Marines. It really was a diplomatic event. And in a month, over half a million people viewed the picture. Each person was given just four seconds to look before they had to move on. 
Gallery trustee Darren Walker recalls that his very first exposure to the National Gallery occurred in elementary school. He remembers watching um, his as his homeroom class watched the black and white newsreel of Jackie Kennedy hosting the Mona Lisa. Four years later, with funds from Elsa Mellon Bruce, the gallery acquired a Leonardo painting of its very own, the renowned portrait of Ginevra da Benci. The daughter of a wealthy Florentine banker, the portrait, it's the only Leonardo in the Americas, was probably commissioned about the time of her marriage at the age of 16. The picture was quite revolutionary, showing a confident teenager in an open setting turned in a three-quarter pose and looking at us. At some point, the panel was cut down, but we don't know exactly when. Ginevra's face is, is framed by the spiky leaves of a juniper bush. Juniper refers to her chastity, the greatest virtue of a Renaissance woman, and is a pun on her name since the Italian for juniper is Ginepro. Our Department of Conservation Science has thoroughly researched this work and discovered what we assume to be one of Leonardo's fingerprints in the paint of the juniper bush, as you see on the screen. Our American collection has grown slowly and steadily through the years. While the European collection was formed in large part by single donors giving a substantial number of works, the American collection consists largely of donations smaller in number of works, but still great in magnitude. In 1950, we quadrupled our galleries for American art and started to add gems to the collection, including Winslow Homer's iconic Breezing Up, perhaps the first American painting purchased directly by the gallery. And Homer had only been dead 30 years when we bought the picture. So um, for us, it wasn't just an American picture, but it was a contemporary purchase. And in 1945, we were given George Innes's luminous Lackawanna Valley. Commissioned by the railroad president, the picture offers a realistic view of Pennsylvania's Lackawanna Valley, celebrating both the beauty of American landscape and advancement of American industry with the steam train and distant roundhouse that you see. Historically, the National Gallery collection did not include works by Native American artists. We have about 600 works of Native American people by white artists, including 350 works by George Catlin. We've begun to add contemporary works by Native American artists, including this powerful collage by Jean Quick to see Smith, Target, and installations by James Luna. These works challenge Native American stereotypes and museum categories. In fact, the, the John Quick to see Smith hangs powerfully in a gallery with artists like Jasper Johns and Andy Warhol, irrefutably holding its own. This period did not only see geopolitical tension with the Cold War, but also strain at home. The Vietnam War, the civil rights struggle, and the assassinations of President Kennedy, Dr. King, and Robert Kennedy brought protest and produced counterculture. How might a national gallery respond to this period? These images of sleeping Vietnam protesters at the gallery just warm my heart. And they make me think of this photo taken in 1941 of servicemen uh, resting at the gallery. And so clearly part of our role as a national gallery is to provide respite when citizens participating in democracy just need a break. It was a difficult period for Washington, DC. Civil unrest and economic recession strained the city. In 1975, the Richmond Times-Dispatch published an editorial calling Washington, quote, the sickest city in the nation due to the high infant mortality, inadequate public health services, high crime rate, and poorly performing schools. Richard Nixon, in fact, liked to say that DC stood for disorder and crime. Three magical elements coalesced at this exact moment to enable the gallery to respond to the time a spot of vacant land reserved for the gallery's future growth, the philanthropic commitment of Paul Mellon and Elsa Mellon Bruce to pay for a new building and to fill it with masterpieces, and the appointment of a charismatic populist director, J. Carter Brown. In 1963, President John F. Kennedy had asked architects working on designs for Washington 
to design, quote, a setting in which men and women can fully live up to their responsibilities as free citizens. And in 1978, the National Gallery opened the East Building, designed by I.M. Pei. Located immediately across from the United States Capitol, it was designed to fill this public mandate. Like Mellon's West Building, the East Building was envisioned as a special place to elevate visitors beyond their everyday concerns. Brown, in fact, stated that he wanted to take people by the lapels architecturally and insisted that their visit shouldn't be a normal moment. Ahead of his time, Brown knew that when visitors arrive, museum architecture can help them to transition away from everyday stress in the mundane world and open them up to wonder. Still admired today, this soaring, and light-filled modernist atrium was an innovative feature of the 1960s and 70s. From its very beginning, the atrium was intended to be an open, active, and welcoming town square. It was also a deliberate contradiction of the rigid enfilade and hierarchical approach of the West Building. At the dedication of the East Building on a very steamy Washington DC day, June day in 1978, President Carter referring to the building as an emblem of our national life, said, this building tells us something about ourselves, about the role of art in our lives, about the relations between public life and the life of art, and about the maturing of an American civilization. One of the needs served by the East Building was gallery space for special exhibitions. The 1976 King Tut exhibition started the museum blockbuster race and the National Gallery sprinted at the head of the pack. To this day, some of our most well-attended exhibitions occurred under Carter Brown's leadership. King Tut, as you see on the screen. Some of you may remember Treasure Houses of Britain. Also circa 1492 and Georgia O'Keeffe. And while packing, I found this photo taken 35 years ago at the gallery when college friends and I traveled here from Ann Arbor to see the O'Keeffe show. Brown recognized that the gallery's European and American focus limited the museum's ability to represent the global world and to attract those great hidden treasures exhibitions that were touring at a time when, when the art of distant lands was just starting to become more accessible museums. The end of the Cold War increased global travel and our explosive digital world meant that these blockbuster hidden treasures, uh, that, they, that they're no longer the audience bait that they were when we first started. Um, and so today we're really thinking differently about exhibition programming, telling new stories and creatively mining the collection. I also believe that the climate crisis will resu result in reduced exhibitions for all of us due to the significant carbon footprint of temporary exhibitions. And now for the final chapter. For most of our history, modern and contemporary art was not a priority for the gallery, due in part to the concern that modern art can be political, potentially upsetting Congress. The reluctance also reflected a need to be cautious about acquiring artists whose importance had not yet been established by the test of time, which is especially important because the National Gallery does not deaccession works of art. The board ruled that an artist had to be dead for at least 20 years to be considered for the gallery's collection. This started to change when Impressionism and Post-Impressionism collector Chester Dale joined the gallery's board. After Dale bequeathed his desirable collection, the New York Times art critic John Kennedy wrote, the Dale collection has thrown the whole National Gallery out of kilter. And a good thing it is too. The place has too much kilter and too little accent. The Dale collection included several of Picasso's masterpieces, such as his Rose Period, Family of Salt and Bank from 1905. At the time of the bequest, Picasso was still enjoying his long life. So we eliminated the death requirement and gratefully accepted the Picasso paintings. I figured if any artist is going to cause you to rethink your, your policies, Picasso is certainly um, one. 
The East Building enabled the gallery to pursue a collection of modern art and hired its very first curator of modern art in 1974. The first opportunity um, was to manage five major commissions in the East Building of singular works, site-specific works, by Alexander Calder, Juan Miro, Anthony Caro, Robert Motherwell, and as you see on the screen, Henry Moore. Nearly 50 years later, the gallery formed an active donor group. Nearly 50 years ago, sorry, the gallery formed an active donor group called the Collectors Committee, whose generosity funds annual additions to our contemporary collection. And I'm delighted to have our committee chair of, of the Collectors Committee, uh, Denise Saul, uh, with us tonight. Thank you for all your hard work for the National Gallery, Denise. You're a busy woman. At this time, we purchased Jackson Pollock's painting, Lavender Mist, one of the artist's most important drip paintings. Painted in his barn studio on Long Island, he laid the canvas on the floor, and using common house paint, he poured, dripped, and flung paint across the surface. The acquisition was a bold move for the gallery, and the work remains one of our most important modern paintings. In embracing modern and contemporary art, the gallery also became a prime location for artists and foundations to locate large bodies of an artist's work. As early as 1949, Georgia O'Keeffe donated over 1,600 photographs by Alfred Stieglitz uh, taken throughout his career. The interesting part about the gift is that we weren't collecting modern art and we weren't collecting photography at the time. But O'Keeffe recognized that a national gallery was the perfect location for the preservation, publication, and in-depth study of Stieglitz's work. Another major milestone in the gallery's expansion into modern art occurred in 1986 when the Rothko Foundation donated over 1,200 paintings and works on paper by Mark Rothko. We lend Rothkos all over the world, mount special exhibitions, and publish research. In fact, this fall, we will mount a breathtaking um, and innovative show focused on Rothko's paintings on paper. So I hope that you'll come to the gallery uh, to see that show. Washington's oldest museum, we heard about it this evening, the Corcoran Gallery, founded in 1869, sadly closed its doors permanently in 2014 after years of financial struggle. The loss is still painful as the Corcoran was always scrappier and more embedded in the local artist community than the federal museums. We aided in the redistribution of the defunct Corcoran Gallery's collection with 10,000 works coming to the National Gallery and another 10,000 distributed to regional museums. The impact has been significant. It is the single largest infusion of American art in our history with iconic works by artists like Albert Bierstadt, Thomas Cole, and Frederick Edwin Church. And of course, here we see Church's famous Niagara painting, which really helped to cement the reputation of the artist. The Corcoran Collection has also expanded the gallery's ability to tell the story of contemporary art, especially with work by women and black artists. The gift included these three joyous paintings by the important African-American uh, painter from Washington, Alma Thomas, who the, the city recently celebrated, as well as this um, magnificent four-panel painting by Joan Mitchell called Salut Tom from 1979. And since 2000, the gallery has made leaps in expanding the collection of works by African-American artists. Significant additions include Carrie James Marshall, Great America, in which the artist reimagines a boat ride in the haunted tunnel of an amusement park as a as the middle passage of enslaved people from Africa to the New World. And Glenn Ligon's untitled I'm a Man is a very important work in the collection, which references, of course, the 1968 sanitation workers' strike, which fatefully brought Dr. King to Memphis. The gallery recently acquired one of Faith Ringgold's most important and iconic paintings, The Flag is Bleeding, from the American People series. Ringgold, who recently celebrated her 92nd birthday, created this mural-sized painting in 1967. For Ringgold, the flag was a subversive symbol, and she used it to communicate her experience as a black woman in America. Ringgold's visceral imagery raises more questions than it answers. 
We don't know that the black man who holds a knife, um, yet his wounds suggest vulnerability. And is the white man in a suit his adversary? Is the white female figure the arbiter of peace? Is the painting about unity or division? In addition to Ringgold, we recently acquired other work by women artists, including Katerina Fritsch's Blue Rooster, titled Han Kok. Affectionately known as the Big Blue Bird, the sculpture stands on our East Building Terrace, keeping watch over Capitol Hill. And about eight months before Supreme Court Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg died, she told me that looking up at the Fritsch was her favorite part of her commute to and from the Supreme Court. And while sitting at my desk shortly after she died, I noticed a motorcade heading along Pennsylvania Avenue from the Capitol. I realized it was RBG and that she would pass by the rooster one last time after lying in state on her way to Arlington Cemetery. As I look towards the future of the National Gallery under my tenure, I think about a return to our founding words and mission to serve and represent the, the entire nation with generosity, vision, and a commitment to excellence. I'm inspired every day by the words of our founders who, while rooted in their own time, dreamed of a museum that always, would always grow and change, expanding in its usefulness. Over the next decade, the National Gallery will expand its usefulness by impacting more Americans with extraordinary loans to communities across America, increased digital content and programming for teachers, students, and the general public, and an enhanced experience on the gallery's 25-acre campus on the National Mall. Today's global world is filled with volatility and uncertainty, sometimes leading to painful polarization, which one sees clearly in Washington. We retreat into our corners, ignoring nuance and the gray area between opposing points of view. But art museums are all about the complex gray area because we're all about people. Art is complicated and messy because people are complicated and messy. Art museums are institutions of paradox. At the end of the day, a very small group of people initiate, shape, and sustain our institutions in service of a greater good uh, for the masses. I'll end my talk this evening with one final collection story that I believe sums up what makes an American National Gallery distinctive. It is the story which some of you may know of Dorothy and Herbert Vogel. Herbert, who died in 2012, was an employee of the US Postal Service, and Dorothy worked as a reference librarian. The Vogels lived modestly in New York on Dorothy's salary, and they spent all of Herbert's salary buying art. They started collecting in the 1960s, focusing largely but not entirely on drawing. Ultimately, they assembled a collection of over 4,000 works of art, which all of which shared their, listen to this, 450 square foot, one bedroom apartment in New York. 4,000 works, 450, along with eight cats and 20 turtles. In just four decades, they assembled one of the most important private collections of art of the 20th century. Stocking their tiny apartment floor to ceiling with Chuck Close sketches, paintings by Roy Lichtenstein, Robert Mangold, and Pat Steer and sculptures by Saul LeWitt and Carl Andre, to name only a few. True public servants, the Vogels gave their collection to the National Gallery because they were inspired by our free admission and national purview. Again, think about the 450 square foot apartment. It took five 40 foot trucks to move the art to Washington. We didn't take the cats or the, or the turtles. To date, the gallery has received almost 1,000 works and aided the Vogels in distributing 2,500 works of contemporary art to every state in the nation. Dorothy visited us not too long ago. She comes every year and toured the Linda Benglis exhibition, assembled almost entirely from their gift. The Vogels lived frugally. They denied themselves so much so that they could support artists and museums and they selected the National Gallery as the permanent repository of their collection because they admired the museum's commitment to making art accessible to everyone. Which brings me back to Andrew Mellon, a man of another era whose lived experience had very little similarity to that of the Vogels, and yet he was motivated by the same patriotism, generosity, and belief in human nobility. 
And so to conclude, I have a, a, just a, a two-minute um, video that I'd like to share um, that we created in the spring of 2021 in the heart of the global pandemic. The shared humanity referenced by President Roosevelt during the Second World War felt ever more urgent to us as the entire world was suffering uh, simultaneously under the pandemic. And we decided that we would share um, our story and imagine a, a different kind of future um, together. So, thank you. Today, all Americans receive a gift. For you, the people of America. A gift that combines a reverence for the past with an eagerness for the future. A gift that inspires, opens doors, frees the imagination. A few generations ago, the people of this country were often taught to believe that art was something foreign to themselves. Then we opened our eyes and saw ourselves reflected in it. It feels almost like she sees me, like she knows me. There's something about it. So mysterious. It makes me think about what connects everybody. I just never feel alone here, even if I am alone. Just gives jingles all around when you see any kind of art. And when you like it, it's, it's even better. Because you kind of get lost in those paintings. As much as I love these artists, at a certain point you realize that I'm not a part of that. And so I have to make my own. Because to be visible is to be human. This building tells us something about ourselves, about the role of art in our lives. In times of turmoil, in times of calm, we find comfort here. The art looks back at us, questions our histories, challenge our assumptions, and enable us to see a different kind of future. It's not just a gift, it's a reminder that we, the people, belong here. A gift of, of the, the nation, nation and for all, all the, the people. people. Today, they are not only works of art. Today, they are the symbol of the human spirit.